Well, good morning. Good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Jude, J-U-D-E. Just before the book of Revelation, we are continuing our uh, series, Hidden Gems of the Bible series, this morning. And um, I thought I would be safe in saying that this is probably one of the hidden gems of the Bible. Sure not. How many of you have read Jude lately? Yeah, I knew I was safe. Oh, Je Betty, you did because you knew I was going to preach on it. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we're in the book of Jude. It's, it's a short book as, as the uh, uh, first, second, and third John are. Let's go ahead and read it together. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, and so this is a letter. This is the format of an ancient letter. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, he's talking about the demons that were thrown out of heaven, but abandoned their own home these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand and what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasonable animals, these are the very things that destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom the blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all the ungodly of all the ungodly acts they've done in the ungodly way and all of the harsh words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's a lot of ungodliness in that sentence, isn't it? These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. 
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. What a book. What a strong book. Not holding anything back, is he? Let's pray. Father, this is your word from a man named Jude, which is short for Judas, which reminds us that there are those who fail, those who work against God, and those who follow God. I pray, Father, that in the next few minutes as we study your word, we as your people will absorb your word, that it will transform our lives, and that we will take the truth to those around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, you'll notice the title of this morning's sermon is Spot Remover, and no, our custodian did not accidentally leave Resolve up here. Um, I had about half a dozen people ask me, is that supposed to be up there today? As if somebody forgot to, there. This is Resolve. And um, I, I, uh, I, I love Resolve. I love laundry stain removers because I have, this, I have this nasty habit. This is a clothing confessional time now. I have this habit of eating something and it drops onto my tie or onto my shirt. Does anybody have that problem from time to time? <laughs> Yes, yes, that's right. I just, I save it for later. In fact, a, a couple months ago, I, I saw a donut. You know, we have donuts in the fellowship hall before Sunday school, and there was one filled with pudding, you know, those kinds of Boston cream. And I thought, this is going to be so good. This is going to be so delicious. And I took a bite, and I walked, you know, I just crammed it, you know, in a couple bites. And I'm walking around and somebody said, uh, you know you got a big thing of pudding right there on your tie. <laughs> and I looked down and sure enough, there it was. And so I, I quickly, I quickly sucked it off the tie. No, I didn't. I, didn't. No, I, didn't. I quickly wiped it off the tie and took the tie from around my neck and ran it under some water hoping, and of course, you know, fortunately it dried by the time church started, uh, but I had to take it home and, and treat it. And uh, some of you have stains in your carpet. This is actually carpet spot remover. And uh, so how many of you guys have one of those garage floors that's pristine? How many of you have? Yeah. What happens when you see a drop of oil or something on it? Or a piece of dirt? It's like... Where did this come from? What happened here? Uh, so we don't like stains. We don't like stains. And I don't know about you, but when that tie finally really dried and I was able to wear it, it, if you go back to the videos, you'll notice it was a red tie. I did not wear my red tie for like two months because I was trying to get the stain out. You know, it became a challenge for me. Uh, but it was such a relief when I when I said, "Oh, this is good enough. I think uh, I think I can wear this again," and I wore it. Uh, I think last week. But at any rate, it's such a relief. Um, on my carpet suddenly there was a stain in my living room carpet. I have no idea how it got there. Do any of you have stains like that on your carpets that just appear? Yeah, I, I well, it's probably Pete, Nancy, if it's if it just appears in your. Um, I mean, I, I live alone, well, except for my daughter, Anna, who lives with me, but I have no idea how that's thing, but I took the Resolve and I was out there spraying it, and when it dried and I vacuumed it and everything, it, it looked great, and I felt such a relief. This is what Jude is talking about, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's talking about Jesus Christ, the spot remover, the stain remover. He's telling us that there is one surefire way to take care of the stain of sin in our lives. Sin does stain us. It is a spot 
on our souls. Sin is things that we do, things that we don't do, things that we say or don't say, things that we think or perhaps don't think. Sin is all through us and it stains our relationship with God and it hurts our relationship with other people. And it hurts our own relationship with even ourselves. Spots need to be removed. And Jude is talking about Jesus Christ as the spot remover. But he's talking about something else as well. In the early church, as I've mentioned before, they did not have a written Bible, as I was telling the children. Everything was passed along orally. Perhaps there were a few copies of some of Paul's letters by this time, but they didn't have the written Bible like we do. And so there were men who went around preaching on behalf of the apostles. And they would say, the apostles walked with Jesus and this is what they saw. And this is what they heard. And there were other teachers who went around and said, well, we weren't there. And we haven't talked to the apostles directly, but let us tell you our version of the truth. And so this stain would creep in to the local churches, which were basically house churches at this point. In some cases, they would misrepresent themselves entirely saying, I come on behalf of Peter, I come on behalf of John, whatever the case may be, but I want to tell you something new. And they just made it up. Making up things is nothing new. It's as old as, well, Cain and Abel. Old as Adam and Eve. And so there was a stain upon the church. And, and if this stain of incorrect teaching had infiltrated the church, there may not be a church today. So it was very important. And this, this man named Jude, who we believe is Judas, not the Judas, but Judas, one of the brothers of Christ. Well, actually one of the half-brothers of Christ. They had the same mother, but a different father. Jesus' father, of course, was God. There were four brothers listed in the Bible. One of them was Judas, and one of them was James. So we believe this was written by one of Jesus' half-brothers. In 1 Corinthians, I think chapter 12, Paul tells us that the brothers of Christ went all through the Roman world preaching Jesus. You see, they weren't followers of Christ while he was alive. You know, sibling rivalry. It's nothing new. Sibling rivalry. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But after his death and resurrection, they became followers and believers. So he writes this, this book. And he says in chapter 1, in, in verse 1, to those who have been called, who are loved by God the Father and kept by Jesus Christ. He said, those of you who have been called, have you heard the call of God to follow Jesus Christ? If you come to this church, if you've been in this church for since its beginning, you know that Jesus Christ is preached on Sunday mornings. If you visit any of our Sunday school classes, you know that Jesus Christ is preached. If you're here on Wednesday night for that discounted $5 meal, you know, you know that Jesus Christ is preached. If you turn on Christian radio, and I hope you do, and I hope you go to Christian websites. You know that Jesus Christ is preached all around us. But has he called you personally? Has God said to you personally? What that means is, has there come a time in your life when you realize God is talking to you? Could be this morning. Could be in your car on the way to work. Doesn't matter where it is. When God speaks to you, you know it. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced that conviction 
of sinfulness where it becomes so clear to you that you are, that we are sinners and we are in big trouble with God. Have you come to that place where the heart's racing, where the Holy Spirit seems to be pulling you out of your seat, where he begins to argue with you and every argument you put up is met by truth and love? <clears throat> have you come to that place where you have knelt your knee figuratively or literally knelt before Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I am yours. Have you heard that call? Have you heard it? If you can't remember being called by God, whether it was a gradual calling, if you grew up in the church, you grew up in Christ, but there was always a time, there's always a time when the gospel message becomes so clear to us, so real to us, and we can't ignore it. This message in verse 3 has been entrusted to the saints. You know, I spoke this morning with the children about a time when there weren't Bibles available for people that most of the people couldn't read, that the printing press hadn't been invented yet, that the church at that time and, religion and, and government leaders kept the Bibles from being translated into the language of the people. It was in Latin at that time. There was a famine of the Word of God. A famine. I believe that we are in a period of famine of the Word of God. I believe that there are people in this neighborhood, in this city, throughout our nation, who have not heard the Word of God or read the Word of God for months, maybe years, maybe decades. You can live your life in this country without ever having to hear the Word of God. And there are so many Christians who don't know the Word of God. And yet Jude is saying to you, I'm urging you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to you, to the saints. He's saying the disciples, the apostles who walked with Jesus have entrusted this word. You need to spread the word. You need to tell people about Christ. I think there in some ways there is as much a famine of the Word of God today in this country as there was in the Middle Ages when there were no Bibles. Bibles do no good if they're not opened. Bible apps do no good if they're not accessed. The Word of God cannot change us. The Word of God cannot fill us. The Word of God cannot transform us if the Word of God is not coming into our souls, into our lives. We've all seen pictures of the children starving around the world with the distended stomachs. We saw that in Ghana. We'll see that again, Mark, when we're there. You go into a little village and, and the, little, the little children, their, their bellies are just like this, just distended because of a lack of proper nourishment and food. I wonder what it would look like if we could see ourselves, see our church, see our community, see the people in this nation with spiritual eyes, how many of us would have distended stomachs because there's a famine, a lack of nourishment, spiritual nourishment in our own lives.
been entrusted to us. Verse 20, he says, Dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Build yourselves up in the faith and the Word and the Spirit. In order for this stuff to work, according to the directions on the back, which are written so small, I have to take my glasses off just to read them. The directions for use, spray the area with resolve. Wait five minutes. Why did I put my glasses back on? <laughs> Blot or rub gently with a clean, damp, color fast, fast cloth or sponge. Rinse the sponge or cloth and repeat as necessary. For best results, treat stains immediately. Set in stains can be more difficult to remove. If last portion of the product is difficult to dispense, Turn the trigger 180, well, you don't need to hear about all that. But. In order for resolve to work, we've got to hit the stain and we've got to let it set there for a little bit. And then we've got to blot it, rub it gently to pull out the stain. In order for the Word of God, in order for Christ to remove the stains of falsehood, the stains of wrong thinking, the stains of sin in our own life or in the body of Christ, the Word of God has got to sit in us and we've got to let it marinate. We've got to let it, we've got to let it set there and work on it and then it will remove it. Word of God. When Bill Dallas witnessed to me as a sophomore at Penn State University, that game stunk last night, by the way. He watched the game, yeah. He said to me, do you have a Bible? I said, yeah, I have a Bible right here in my bookcase. And no kidding, I had no idea at the time this was a thing. I, I took it out and I had to go <laughs> blow off the dust. <laughs> And he started laughing at me. And I didn't realize that was a thing at the time, you know, blowing the dust off the Bible. Spurgeon said, this is great. Spurgeon was a famous, Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher. He said, some of us have so much dust on our Bibles, we can write damnation with our fingers in the dust. <laughs> well, you gotta love Spurgeon. You gotta love Spurgeon. This is the word of God. People paid a price with their lives to pass it down from one generation to the next. People paid with their lives to get it into our hands. For hundreds and hundreds of years, there was a famine of the Word of God throughout Europe, throughout the world. And today, in a lot of our communities, maybe the people we know, maybe even ourselves, there's, a still, there's still a famine of the Word of God. If you want to remove the stains, if we want to remove the stain of sin in our life and error in our church, we've got to have some resolve that we are going to pump ourselves up with the Word of God so God can do His work in our lives. Let's pray. Father, I, I didn't know how this was going to come out. But we all share in the guilt of not knowing the Word of God. I thank you, Lord, for um, our Sunday school classes and our new Bible studies that have started. I thank you that Wednesday night is very popular. We're very hungry. And I thank you for those of us who study the Word on a regular basis to inoculate ourselves to vaccinate ourselves against the slings and arrows of Satan. I pray, Father, that we would be truly people of the book. Truly people of the book.
I pray that we would be known in our own hearts and to you especially as people who feast on the word. Father, may the word change our lives. In Christ's name, amen.